speaker is Mr. Andrew Baxter, who hopefully becomes Dr. Andrew Baxter in 55 minutes. Uh, 50 minutes for the talk uh, and five minutes for the deliberation. It's also the defense, uh, the PhD defense, and everybody who is not on the committee will be requested to leave after the public questions. But hopefully it won't take long. But let me remind you, uh, Mr. Baxter, that one way to fail, for sure, regardless of the other merit of this, is to go uh, if you want to. Can I just end after two minutes and then I'm done? <laughs> Not people whole time. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you all for, for coming to my PhD events. It's nice to see friendly faces. Uh, so my thesis title, Algorithms for Permutation Statistics. Uh, so the objects that we're looking at are permutations. We're looking at the nice algebraic objects with combinatorial objects. We're using one line notation, the numbers one through n, no repeats uh, in some order. So for example, uh, we're going to be using, I'm generally going to be using pi for my permutations. This is custom 3, 1, 2, 4, 5, where, where I'll say pi i is the i letter. Um, my numbers are letters. All right, so that's generally going to be the notation that I'm going to be using. Uh, a few preliminary definitions uh, that I'm going to be referring back to. The reduction of a finite sequence of, I'm just going to stick with distinct integers, although you can really make them real numbers without any problems. Uh, Permutation <coughs> obtained by replacing the ith smallest letter smallest letter with just i. So for example, the reduction of four eight seven two is two four. 3, 1. We place the 2 with a 1 because it's the smallest. 4 becomes a 2, the 3 becomes, the 7 becomes a 3, and 8 becomes a 4. We sort of smash everything down to be, to form a unique permutation. Uh, if the reduction of two finite sequences if they both reduce to the same permutation, then we then we write that a1 will the end. This is something called we say order. These are order isomorphic. They're in the same relative order. So what I want to do is these are general definitions. What I want to try to do is walk through my thesis, uh, the first few chapters of my thesis, all through the same common pattern all through the pattern 2, 3, dash 1, uh, which I'll define them. So let's just define that in that term. Permutation <coughs> pi contains 2, 3, dash 1. If there are indices, i less than j such that pi i, pi i plus 1, pi j. So technically, j needs to be greater than i plus 1. Uh, if those two, if those are order isomorphic to 2, 3, 1. So we have a middle followed by something higher than it. And then somewhere down the line, there's something even smaller than both of them. So for example, 1, 3, 6. 4, 2, 5. If we look at the 3, the 6, and the 2, that is a copy of 2, 3, dash 1. So a, a given occurrence of this is called a copy of 2, 3, dash 1. I should say that 3, 4, 2 within this permutation is not 
a 2, 3, dash 1 because while it makes a 2, 3, 1 pattern, a middle, high, low pattern, they're not adjacent in the proper way. Uh, this is a copy of 2, dash 3, 1 in the general terminology. Uh, it has the 2, 3, 1 pattern and the gap ends up there. It's also, this, this uh, definition really generalizes, you put dashes wherever you want. Um, and it is a copy of 2 dash 3 dash 1. Just because you have a dash there doesn't mean you have to have interposing letters. You're just allowed to have interposing letters. So for an arbitrary pattern, the numbers here give you relative orders of highs, lows, and middles. Uh, really, the lack of a dash tells you where adjacencies have to occur. A dash is just sort of an allowance. You're allowed to have interposing letters. Um, this is really the core definition for the rest of the talk. Uh, are there questions here before I go on? This is the linchpin. So what my chapters uh, outline, the first, I guess, chapters two through five can really be talked about in this lens, right, a lens of two, three, dash one. Um, so what chapter two does, that gives you the number of permutations this is, and this is symmetric group length n, permutation of the length n, uh, with k copies. So you want to know if you have one copy, two copies, no copies, that sort of thing. Um, this, this, the techniques in this chapter provide an answer to that question. Uh, chapter oh, three by five, like I understood. Yes. yes. So that two three that two three dash one is a running example, I should say. Um, this is part of a family of about 20 different patterns that these same techniques apply for. Uh, chapter 3 is the number of permutations. We're going to specialize with zero copies. <coughs> 2, 3, dash 1. So you say, well, this is a special case. Um, here, 2, 3, dash 1 is part of an infinite family. Um, uh, I've proven that it's part of an infinite family uh, of uh, permutations which have methods to count this. Um, as far as in practice, I've actually computed about 2,700 different examples uh, of 2,700 different siblings of this 2, 3, dash 1. So it's a much more general case in that, in that scenario. Um, chapter 4 tells you number of pi and SN with zero copies of 2, 3, dash 1 and K inversions, which is I'll define. Uh, this is a statistic of permutations about disorder. And L descent. So you tell me uh, you tell me other things that you're interested in about the permutations, and I can answer that question as well. And chapter five is a functional equation version of chapter three, in short. Uh, and answer some of the criticisms of the techniques in chapter three. Uh, I probably not going to get through all of this, but I just wanted to summarize what these things do. Uh, chapter six doesn't have much to say about 2, 3, dash 1. Uh, it deals with, of these permutations that avoid 2, 3, dash 1, how many of them are even, as in the alternating group, how many of them are even. Uh, chapter seven really has little to do with 2, 3, dash 1. It has to do with asymptotic distribution. I'm definitely not going to be getting to that, so I'm going to leave that out. Um, and even among these, the order in which I'm going to attack these, I'm going to go after chapter 3 first, uh, mention what chapter 5 has to say about it, uh, mention what chapter 4 has to say about it, and then if there's time, no, chapter 3, but I'm pretty sure there won't be, otherwise I won't get my PhD. <laughs> All right. So I want to talk about chapter three, permutations of avoiding it. Sorry to interrupt. No, no problem. Since I'm only a simple mathematical physicist, <laughs> why on earth do you bother to actually look into this? Why, why what, is, what is the motivation? Okay. It must have some uh, importance somewhere. But I hope we were. To get a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> motivation one, PhD. Uh, motivation two, um, these sorts of pattern avoidance questions showed up historically first in, uh, in computer science, Don Knuth, art of computer programming, sorting problem. 
Um, you have certain machines that can sort only certain ways. That's For example, you've, that's why the order. That's why the order matters. You want to try to get the, the stack of boxes sorted in the right way, you can only do certain maneuvers. Um, that was classical pattern avoidance. Um, I, I should mention that. Uh, no, that thank you, though. Um, yeah, so the, it's sorting questions is one big thing. Um, there's, this is starting to find applications in bioinformatics as well, in computational biology. Um, instead of sequences of numbers, there's sequences of nucleotides. You can look at patterns that way. Um, so, you know, moving on to uh, chapter three. This is enumeration schemes. and dash patterns. Um, these are what are called dash patterns because they have dashes in them. Patterns originally did not have dashes in them. Uh, so this is, this is a generalization of an old, uh, an old object. When I say old, I mean about 20, 25 years. Um, I guess 35. Okay. Uh, enumeration schemes. Uh, oh, as I should mention, this is joint work with Laura Pudwell at uh, Valparaiso. Uh, Rutgers PhD from 2008, who also did the schemes as part of her PhD thesis. Right, so enumeration schemes are uh, special kinds of recurrences that help us compute pattern avoidance kinds of questions. Uh, they were rich, they were developed. Uh, I guess the first paper was 98. Zylberg was 98, um, and then they were approved, uh, improved about nine years later by Vince Vader, another Rutgers PhD, and then they've been. Uh, extended to various other contexts uh, by Laura, and now by Laura and myself. Uh, a scheme, which is an enumeration scheme, I'm just going to shorten the scheme, is a particular kind of recurrence. And their greatest strength is that they can be computed, uh, found by computer. Found by a computer. What you do is you say, I want to, I want to avoid, uh, I want to count the number of permutations with zero copies of pattern A, B, and C. You hand that to the computer. You also give it some search parameters so it doesn't run on forever. Uh, and if there is a scheme that fits within those, those parameters, the computer will say so. The computer will hand it off to you and say, here, I've proven that this, uh, that this recurrence works for the patterns that you're asking about. So the input is patterns to avoid, the output is another recurrence, there is another algorithm. So they work on two core principles. Uh, well, it's, it's, well, one core principle, uh, which has two parts. Divide and conquer. This is a common approach in computer science. So let's uh, take a moment to define a little bit of notation here that I should have done before. Um, that A n, A for avoid, be the subset of S n where uh, this is the set of permutations avoiding 2, 3, dash 1. So for example, for example here, something that does that, yeah. 5, 3, 1, 4, 2. You can check, you're never going to see a 2, 3 followed by a 1 later on. The only rise that actually happens is this 1, 4, and that 2 is too big to count as a 2, 3, dash 1. So that's a permutation of avoiding 2, 3, 1. A, N is, of course, the set that contains that among others. Oh, uh, yeah, they all have length then. Um, oh, I, one historical, I'm getting all mixed up here. Uh, one historical note about schemes. Uh, these, these were originally designed for classical pattern avoidance. Uh, these were not designed for these dash patterns. These were designed for patterns where essentially there's dashes everywhere, something like this. Something where you're allowed to have arbitrary gaps between the letters. Uh, this added restriction of adjacencies uh, 
messes things up at a couple stages along the way, and I'll point them out. So these were schemes were originally designed for this, for something like this. Right. Um, right, so there's our set of avoiders. What we're going to do is divide a n according to prefix. When I say divide, it's, we're partition, we're formally partitioning a n. So a n one two. These are the set of permutations, and a n such that our first two letters look like a 1, 2. They're rising. Pi 1 is less than pi 2. And similarly, we put in a 2, 1 there. It wants to start with a fall, start with a descent. Uh, we can divide farther by putting in longer patterns that we're interested in, and we're just, we just restrict this even further. But uh, for this particular case, this is as far as we need to go. So I'm going to stop there. Um, so notice that, I mean, this really is a partition this is disjoint union. Um, and this is whenever you have n at least 2. So uh, once we have this, we're going to actually cut this down a little bit farther. The, the hope is that we can count each of these pieces individually. We can divide and conquer, we can conquer each little piece. Maybe we can, maybe we can. In this case, we can. Uh, in order to do that, we've got to cut these down even farther. So what we'll do is, where this is either 1, 2, or 2, 1, uh, we put our prefix pattern B, <coughs> and A, B, these are actual letters. These are the actual letters of the permutation that show up. So this is all permutations in A and P, such that pi 1, pi 2 equals a, B, in that order. So our first letter is A, second letter is B. And that, that, this could be 1, 2, or 2, 1. Uh, it'll also be useful to have this notation. This is all, all permutations uh, that avoid it, such that pi 1 equals A. You can think of this first letter as forming the pattern 1, which isn't all that interesting. I just wanted to use this notation to stay consistent with this notation that one isn't really necessary, strictly. There's, like, there's a bit of redundancy here. If you know what the first two letters actually are, you already know what the pattern is. So for example, an 2, 1, 5, 3. There's going to be three permutations in there. 5, 3, 1, 2, 4, 5, 3, Two and five, three, two, one, four. Each of these starts out with five, three. Each of these avoids two, three, dash one. You mean a five? Uh, this is a yes. Thank you. It's a five. Uh, if it's a six, we'd have a bunch. We'd have a few more. There's a six that would appear somewhere along there. How do we count these things? How do we, once we cut it that this far, we have a lot of information about these pieces, hopefully enough to get enough information about how to count them. Right, so we're going to conquer, uh, count the number of permutations in each piece by two means. Two approaches here. One, Sometimes we know that it's impossible for a permutation to start with a, b, and still avoid 2, 3, dash 1. This is accomplished by something called gap vectors. Uh, th these are criteria that will tell us that um, method 2 it will be by, via bijections. Hopefully, if this does not occur, well, however many permutations are in there, are equinumerous, 
with maybe some other permutation. You cut out you cut out one of the letters from the beginning, and as it turns out, we get a bijection here. Uh, in which case, they have the same size. Assumingly, we, we had counted this already in the course of getting here. And so we can just use whatever number this is, and that's the same number there. So let's see this in practice. Uh, approach one there. That, that ends up showing up uh, here. Consider 1, 2, comma, A, B. So we start off with the rise, and the letters are actually A and B. Well, this is ripe for forming a 2, 3, dash 1 pattern. If anything ever shows up after this A, B that's less than A, that makes our 2, 3, 1. This ends up, so this ends up being 0 if A is greater than 1. Otherwise, A, B, and then there's a one that will show up somewhere that makes our two through. Uh, this whole thing this gets encoded in a certain way. Um, this criterion can be generalized, and if it's if a minus one, b minus a minus one, n minus b dominates this vector. So what that means is component-wise, a minus 1, if a minus 1 is greater than or equal to uh, 1, because a minus 1, uh, or, or and this is true and that is true, which is really easy because they're zeros. Um, if that is true, then an 1, 2, a, b is empty. And notice that it's for any n, 2 or more. Well, that's not going to happen when n equals 2, because this will just have to be 1, 2. But whatever, this is for, for any n, this ends up being empty. A and B satisfy this criterion. This is called our gap vector. Well, here's the magic thing about gap vectors. Uh, these are, this is an infinite number of statements, because it's for all the different n's. But we can check whether or not a given gap vector, whether a given vector is a gap vector. Uh, by uh, checking finitely many different permutations. We reduce this down to a finite check. So um, that's theorem 18, which I'm not going to prove, but uh, vector v is a gap vector if, if it uh, if a certain set, a certain finite set of permutations pass, this is a certain criterion. Uh, I'm not going to go through exactly how that works, but you look at a finite number as generated by this V. If they all, as it turns out, they all contain the 2, 3, dash 1 pattern in a certain way, uh, then that vector that you've given, that you've asked about, is indeed a gap vector. Uh, this is a sufficient, not necessary condition. It's possible that there are gap vectors out there uh, that this misses, that are false negatives, but we haven't actually seen any in practice. So this might be a full characterization, but at the very least, it's a sufficient condition, which is enough to compute. So of course, I mean, of course the theorem in the, in the thesis goes into a little more depth than what I've written. And that finitely many, it can get large. If you want to try to uh, check a given vector, you have to you add up the components of that vector and take that factorial, and that's the number of permutations you have to check. So, it's a significant burden. So you really, you really only check vectors that have a uh, component total like two or less in practice. But as it turns out, that's usually all you need. Okay. Um, so we can now count certain of those an one two a b's. <coughs> 
Um, approach two uh, it follows something called reverse, reversibly deletable letters. So consider a n one b. So it's, it's our a b, except we know that a has to be a one. Otherwise, it's empty. What we'll do is we'll take pi 1 through pi n. We're going to perform a deletion on that. What that does is we take, we take, we start off with our permutation, cut off the first letter, and reduce it down. And then we get some other permutation. And the question is, what sort of properties is that? does that uh, mutilated permutation have? <clears throat> well, as it turns out, in this case, since we're going to 3-1, cutting off that first letter isn't going to make a 2-3-1 appear. If this already avoids it, cutting off the head isn't going to make one show up. So we know that this deletion map maps avoiders into avoiders. They're going to be missing the first letter there. When you reduce it down, that B becomes B minus 1. Now here's the remarkable thing. This is actually a bijection. If we were to take this map and, and reverse it, we would start here. We start with the permutation here. Throw in a 1 at the front. We're not going to make a 2, 3, 1 pattern then either. So as it turns out, this, I'll say, happens to be a bijection. I mean, it's always going to be a bijection if you're not worrying about avoidance properties. You can always uh, delete or throw back in an initial letter. The question is, how does that interact with the pattern you're trying to avoid? So this happens to be a bijection. So so we know that the number of elements in each set there is the same. So assumedly we've counted this previously, and so now we can get this one. Uh, what about a n two one? Now we're starting with a fall. As it turns out, the same map is going to work in the same way. Here it's going to be a little bit more sophisticated for reasoning. When we delete that first letter, we're not going to make a 2, 3, dash 1 pattern show up. Uh, and that gets us this. Now, when we delete that A, the reduction B doesn't actually change anymore. Um, oh, yes, this should be a 1. So we cut off, that, we cut off the head there. Um, and as it turns out, we started here and just threw in an extra letter in the front to make it an, in an increase. Uh, that's not going to create a 2, 3, dash 1 pattern either. So again, this deleting the first letter, uh, deleting the first letter is a bijection. If we were working with a different pattern, it wouldn't always be the first letter. It could be the second letter that we deleted. We always delete something from the prefix that we know something about. Uh, but it's a bit of a trial and error. But it's finitely many trials. And each trial takes finitely many checks. And the computer does it. And the computer does it for us, so who cares how long it takes? Well, it has to take a reasonable amount of time. So algorithm 20 in my thesis outlines a finite procedure uh, to test whether dr forms You, you pick which letter you want to delete, the first letter or the second letter, and so on. Um, and what it does is it has to go through finitely many checks to see if this is indeed a bijection, or maybe it's possible that deleting a letter can create a pattern. Um, you need to check two things. Deletion can make a forbidden pattern. So to see that, say we were deleting that second letter, we would get, once we reduce, 
two, three, one. And so this goes from something, this does not have two, three, dash one in it to something that does. Because the deletion creates an adjacency. This is something that you don't see in the classical case where you have all the dashes in place. 